property during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm so excited to be here today. And this webinar is specifically hosted in collaboration with the Workforce Development Hub and the Academic Pharmacy section. As we go to the next slide, uh, I introduce myself. I'm Toyin Tafade, and um, Dean and Professor at Howard University College of Pharmacy. Um, as we move along, I want you to know that you have an opportunity to serve in different ways in FIP, and we'll be happy to share with you what some of those opportunities are. On the next slide, uh, this basically shares all the details regarding what is available to you um, as FIP. There are important links and resources to you, available to you through uh, the Facebook group. We have some people who will be watching us from Facebook and will be entertaining their questions as well. And we thank you for taking advantage of these links so that I can provide up-to-date resources for you. On the next slide, uh, we have some information for you um, regarding who will be speaking today and also uh, regarding some of the objectives for the presentation today. Uh, apologies, so we noticed the slides are not advancing as quickly as we would like. Thank you for your patience uh, with that. All right, so a little bit about FIP. FIP is a global federation of national associations representing 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists around the world. And its mission is to improve global health by supporting the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences, and education. Um, we know that you are joining because you have interest in the subject matter. If you're not already a member of FIP, we invite you to join. Um, on the next slide, we have some additional information for you, specifically regarding um, the academic section. If the slides will advance. Uh, thank you for your patience. This is a new portal. FIP is sort of uh, piloting and we are excited to test it out. On the next slide. All right. So just to let you know, the academic section um, is available to serve you and our president is John Pieper and um, He's actually one of the uh, FIP fellows. And so we are excited to uh, introduce you to the FIP officers on the uh, next slide. And so basically, if there's any question that you have for any of these officers, feel free to, to ask them uh, directly. On the next slide, you will see um, some additional information regarding the house rules for today. This webinar is being recorded and is also being live streamed on Facebook. The free uh, available recording will be on fip.org backslash coronavirus. You may ask questions through the Q&A box and we welcome your feedback. Uh, feel free to send information to webinars at fip.org. On the next slide, um, you should be able to see some additional details regarding the objectives for today's session. Uh, we'll be describing the gender equity gap in healthcare, examples of ways women and men are challenging the narrative during the COVID-19 pandemic, and discussing opportunities to continually recognize the gender equity gap and those who may take on formal or informal leadership roles during this pandemic. I'm really excited to introduce to you a suite of international panelists. And on the next slide, you should be able to see some of those um, uh, details. 
So we have uh, Dr. Vibudi Aria, professor and advisor, the global lead uh, in gender equity and diversity, WDG 10. She is from the USA. We have Dr. Miranda Law, clinical assistant professor at Howard University. She is also FIP global lead for WDG 6, also from the USA. We have Carlin McMahon, community pharmacist and global lead in gender equity and diversity, WDG 10 uh, from Australia. And we have uh, Nadia Bukhari, who's academic pharmacist, global lead, gender equity, WDG 10 from the UK and uh, linkages to Pakistan. We also have um, uh, Manesh Prabhat, who's chief pharmacist and lead for uh, leadership, leadership development of UDG 6 from the UK. These individuals are very passionate about the subject matter, challenging the narrative on leadership and gender equity during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm gonna turn it over to Miranda Law, who's going to be starting. Uh, you'll see her photo on the next slide. And um, take it over, Miranda. Thank you so much, Toyan. Hi, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here and to speak with you about leadership and gender equity. Um, so to get us started, why don't we go to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of some important points that have been brought up by the WHO in their most recent gender and equity analysis on health workforce. If you haven't read this report yet, and this is an area that you are interested in learning more about, I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, but the intent for today is really to provide you with some background on why my colleagues and I are here today speaking about this topic. So uh, without any further delay, what are the current facts and stats on gender equity in the healthcare workforce around the world? Um, so first, women constitute the majority of the healthcare workforce, but unfortunately, when you evaluate the roles they're actually playing, they're more likely to be on the ground workers rather than in senior leadership roles. And that may be due to the fact that in many countries, norms and culture around gender discrimination may constrain the ability for women to attain the leadership or seniority roles that they might want. Gender discrimination is also found to constrain men. And I think this is a really important point to bring up because often when we think about gender equity, uh, we assume that the impact is on women um, and only on women. But in fact, men who are interested in careers that do not um, fit in with normal the, or gender norms are also constrained. So for example, men who may want to be nurses. Um, so that's definitely something that also needs to be taken into consideration. Disadvantages brought on by gender are also not standalone problems. So they can often be compounded with other factors such as race as well as social class, causing further detriment to these individuals' abilities to rise in their careers. Um, and these imbalances in the workforce can trickle down and impact much larger public health goals in the world, um, including the ability to achieve sustainable development goals as well as universal health care. And lastly, the report did mention that in low and middle income countries, more research is needed to fully understand the major gaps on gender and equity. So again, if this is a topic that you are interested in, maybe you can also take the lead and fill in some of these research gaps. Next slide, please. So with these findings, uh, what kind of impact are these stats really having on healthcare around the world, right? Why do we care to fix it and why do we want to fix it? Well, for one, as it currently stands, the health systems um, are not as strong as they should or could be. Women do not have equal say in the design of health policies and plans due to their lack of leadership roles. And you know, in the past, we've all probably discussed health system strengthening as this broad overarching idea, but in this current pandemic, never has it been more important for us to make sure that each of our country's health systems, our policies, our plans are functioning to the best of their ability, which unfortunately isn't necessarily always the case in the present time. Secondly, the current segregation of roles based on gender drives both the pay gap between men and women and can lead to loss of talent for those who do not pursue roles that their gender does not fit into. Uh, the 2018 
global wage report shows that around the world, uh, women are actually earning 20% less than men. Um, and it has been like this for at least the past decade. So to even begin to fix this, gender norms and roles need to be broken down and the narrative needs to change. Third, um, in an area that my colleague, the beauty, will dive a little bit more into shortly is that female workers must fit into systems that are designed for male life patterns. And this includes how work days are scheduled, what policies look like in the workplace, and likely this is because, male, because males are the ones in the leadership positions that are setting these norms. This can impact what women do and how they achieve their career goals. Um, and the WHO states that workplace gender equity could be more than 200 years away, which is very unfortunate. And hopefully that trajectory can change uh, based on what we do in the present. Next slide, please. So speaking on what we should be doing to try and improve gender and equity in the workforce, we are encouraging everybody to challenge the narrative. Women should be valued as agents of change. This is not a call for people to look at women and think, oh, sorry for you, because we're not victims. If you take the time to really look around you at what is being done around the world in the current pandemic, you will see so many men and women working outside of their traditional roles, women who are leading the care for COVID patients and men who have gladly stepped back and taken on more roles in the home. Over the next hour, we will have some really great speakers lined up for you who are going to be discussing more on gender and equity during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so it is my pleasure to now pass the stage over to the beauty. Thank you, Marinda. Um, so I'm the beauty, Aria. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about, you know, we know that there is need to change the narrative, but how do we do that? And so on the next slide, one of the things that we're going to be discussing is really thinking about when we talk about equity in general, and it's not specific to race, but also, or gender, but also thinking about any majority group where you have somebody who's trying to speak up and become, um, operate in there, is the recognition of power dynamics. So one of the things that people usually do is kind of, we have more women doing X, Y, Z. We have more women at the table, but we really need to think about the power dynamics. And like Miranda mentioned, the structures that have been traditionally created by men, losing the perspective of how we can fit that to accommodate other perspectives, such as women's role um, within the homes and some of the other nuanced things that I'll be going into. So you can have women at the table, but it won't really set them up for success unless you have structural support for them. So mentoring, understanding how to have conversations around maternity and what happens when they come back to the workforce, even the availability of things, for example, in the US, such as um, that has been more accepted in the workplace is lactation rooms for mothers who are returning to work and may need breaks built in. Um, there's lots of different structural supports that need to be reinforced, for example, resources. And really, when we talk about equity, we're talking about meeting things where they are, not just having the numbers of support, so increasing our enrollment, increasing more women in leadership, but really, do we have the structures that support these women to succeed in leadership? When you think about the intersectionality, so now kind of like a Venn diagram, it's not just race. Um, and gender, but when you put them two together, and we're talking about, as we can all see around the world, this conversation on structural racism, that there are built-in structures that are harmful for even the women who do make it to the table um, and have other things that they need to worry about. And like Miranda mentioned, this is really pointing out um, that we do not need to see women as victims, but really how do we support more of that perspective to join the conversation and enjoy the shared decision making and the leadership that would produce better results in a more comprehensive strategy or policy for everybody. Because understanding power dynamics that are um, only favoring the majority, whatever that may be, is actually harmful to all. Um, roles and sort of gender normative roles are, are harmful to also men, particularly given this pandemic when women are working from home. If we go on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what that means. So working from home, essentially what happened was everybody sort of shifted your normal workspace, 
nine to five, whatever the hours you were following, the meetings, the check-ins, the work, the reports, everything just shifted to home without accommodating for the fact that not everybody may have stable remote connections. Um, women often are splitting attention. There was a study actually uh, done in the UK where they were showing that more women had interrupted time doing their work um, than men. And, and this may just be that women are adopting more homeschooling, um, doing more housework, and essentially also still be expecting to maintain that same productivity for the work in that space at home. And so there is, it's hard to understand how to intentionally separate work and home, where it was easier for me, for example, to go to work, concentrate without my children, without home, and then come back home and be concentrated in that space. But we're finding more and more that women are being stressed in understanding how to even separate because there is no longer a separation of work and home. Um, it depends on their space. It depends, you know, who, who actually gets to have the office space. Um, you know, whose Zoom calls get prioritized if it's the, both the, um, a man and a woman working from home. I think one of the interesting things to point out here is that in sort of the social science research, when any group is trying to become part of the majority, so for example, women in the workforce where traditionally there have been more men in leadership, um, it's difficult to maintain your full identity. And so there is a notion of sort of losing part of that identity to become part of the majority. And sometimes people are criticized for this and saying, you know, you're becoming part of the boys or you're wearing pants or whatever, even the vocabulary and the sentiments we have around that can be pretty harmful to understanding that um, social norm. And so what happens is over time, um, that group can sometimes internalize that inferiority or internalize some of that marginalization. And so I've been talking to lots of women who don't even question and just sort of give up their office space to their husbands, for example, um, and this is assuming a heterosexual household. And so, and, and men want to help out. Men want to say, hey, I don't need, I can take my call in the kitchen. I don't need to have the office. But why is it that as women, um, a lot of them don't speak up? And so there is something to be said about the psychology of understanding what um, sort of marginalization does to groups. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, how women are still serving in supportive roles. So for example, publishing by women authors has actually gone down, but there are lots of women still doing peer reviewing. And so this is another example of sort of this notion of led by men delivered by women. We're still seeing that in light of this pandemic where we have adopted these roles and are, are not as being as advocate, advocates of really speaking up and saying, I need to parse out my time. And again, that goes back to the notion of are there is there mentorship? Are there resources and support built in so women can feel comfortable advocating um, that won't be seen as victimhood, that won't be seen as, oh, they're complaining. And so I think that we need to be very deliberate in our policies and in our structures to understand how we can be supportive so that we actually set people up for success and not just say, well, they're at the table, problem solved. And this also deals with informal caregiving. So having both parents, so older um, elders around, but also then kids and women tend to kind of start taking on those roles. And this is, of course, a generalization. Many households have where men are stepping up to take care of these roles. Some of us are on the webinar right now. Um, we have means of if we have a person working at home with us, um, a husband or anybody else that they kind of take over. And so it's obviously not true of every household, but we are seeing that as, um, as something that women are kind of ha having to grapple with. On the next slide, we'll see that um, there is also this kind of notion, and this was really hard to find slides that didn't um, that had persons of color in in this kind of notion. People think that you know you're at home, you must be having this beautiful time with your kids. They're so cute, they're angels. Um, even family, right? Mothers and fathers of daughters thinking that they're just having a great time, picking flowers in the garden or taking walks all the day. And women feel that they're kind of having to juggle so many responsibilities and we feel like superheroes that don't wear capes all the time. Um, but certainly society's view of what women staying at home or being moms at home do are not congruent with what's actually happening when we're juggling one child on one leg, another child on another leg and typing emails that hopefully don't have typos, muting ourselves in Zoom calls or taking the camera off so we can 
serve meals while we're also concentrating on work. So there are lots of conflicting roles that women find themselves, specifically given in light of the pandemic where most people are now working from home. And so it's important to realize that the perspectives may not be as congruent as actually what's happening. And actually even the perspectives of different parts of society um, may not think that what you're doing is actually what you're doing at home. So it's really interesting to see how those converge. And again, as we're thinking about policies and programming, how do we be, how do we make ourselves be deliberate about making sure that we're creating structures that actually are setting women up for success? Next slide. And one of the things I wanna point out, and I think globally folks are finding this to be more and more challenging, um, especially those of us, so I've been doing work in racial equity for over a decade. And in this moment that I think hopefully will be pivotal in history, it's also the more challenging within the space of activism to actually parent your child. So as we're holding space for conversations, also needing space, it's become a very challenging time, especially with little kids who are not able to process everything that is happening in its totality, to be parenting and having patience and mealtime and doing dishes and doing all of this housework and also being very, very productive at work and um, holding, again, the space of conversations that not only align with your timing in your household with bedtime or mealtime, but also that may be conducive to organizations wanting you for those um, webinars or conversations to take place. And so just wanna you know, set the stage that there, there's lots happening. It's a multi-pronged um, sort of approach in how we have to look at this because not every lived experience for one woman um, is the lived experience for every woman. And so we do have to take that into account and challenge the assumptions that we all make in terms of how we look at women being at the table and what that will bring. So hopefully this will allow us to be more conscious about the policies and the programs and the structures that we create moving forward and how we can actually set women up for success taking into account all the other roles that we're all playing um, collectively and as individuals. So I will be happy now to hand this off to my colleague, Nadia Bukhari, who will talk a little bit more about specific stories and how women are dealing with this around the world. Sorry, I guess Manish will be next. I apologize, Manish. Um, right. So go ahead. No, no problems, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Manish Parbat, just to confirm. Um, I'm going to give, give in an overview around three uh, case studies that are from one of which, which is from India and another two from the UK around some leadership from both men and women. So on to the next slide. So this is Mansi uh, Shah Doshi. Um, she's a pharmacist from India. And um, basically she works in medicines optimization clinics within the community and also provides leadership and, and clinical role within a private clinic for rheumatology in Varodra in Gujarat. She also um, leads and provides support to a polyclinic in Mumbai, which focuses on service development and medicines optimization. Um, she provides support around medicines in not just a community setting, but also the hospital setting. Next slide, please. So leadership during the pandemic, I guess this has been an ongoing journey for Mansi, uh, in all honesty. It started from uh, 2011. Uh, she works across two cities, travels to and fro, uh, providing tele and video consultation, which becomes, which has become an inherent uh, practice within uh, most parts, well, some parts of India, uh, to be able to provide education, counselling and medicines information, not just to patients, but to other healthcare professionals also. This has been a pivotal moment uh, from, from speaking to Mansi in that it's actually gradually increasing the awareness of what pharmacists can actually do in the time of need, such as a pandemic, and how pharmacists can react to such a process. So this has involved in implementing virtual practice during um, the pandemic, um, working with different uh, healthcare practitioners, uh, prescribers, and also patients and also continuing to develop virtual consultations, which can offer round the clock service. And as again, you know, offering that medicines information when needed via digital and tele-support is also crucial and vital. Next slide, please. So what has been the challenges as a woman and a pharmacist and a leader? 
Well, clinical pharmacists have not actually been recognized, uh, according to Mansi in India, to be frontline practitioners and not been defined as the COVID, the, the, the COVID warriors. During this challenging time, time management during teleconsultations has always been a challenge. Uh, and, and lack of awareness around what pharmacists can actually do to support the general population and healthcare professionals has been an ongoing challenge. Gender, well, according to Mansi, this hasn't been a, a challenge during the, during the pandemic, but what has been a challenge was seniority and experience in more significant, is, is a more significant issue. Next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Jagdeep Sangha from the UK. Uh, he's a pharmaceutical advisor in primary care, working at Dudley Clinical Commissioning Group, Pharmaceutical Public Health. Jagdeep has been involved with the rapid redesign of end-of-life care pathway and ensuring that patients at the end of life get are prioritised and get the medicines when they need them. This has meant that Jagdeep's been working overnight to provide um, overnight care for uh, end-of-life patients and this service was mobilised within 72 hours and redesigned very promptly. In addition to that, he has been providing support to what we call the red centres for where patients are at risk of, of COVID, so they can actually be managed and monitored appropriately and have a collaborative approach with local community pharmacies. A number of guidelines have had to be updated during this period to um, encompass the, the current pandemic, such as drug monitoring, um, ensuring that patients get the right and appropriate safe care that they actually need also. Next slide, please. So challenges as a man, a pharmacist and a leader. Well, being a male during this pandemic, Jag, Jagdeep suggests that it hasn't actually been an issue. He's been able to demonstrate the leadership in response to this changing and fluid situation. He's been able to have the autonomy and decision-making powers that are required to ensure that a high quality of care is, is, is delivered and is safe also. More more than being a male, Jagdeep feels that he's proud of, of the leadership he's demonstrated during this COVID pandemic as a minority ethnic, of which there are limited individuals within the organisation that he works. Next slide, please. This is Najma Ibrahim from the UK. She's another fantastic pharmacist that works with, as a local community pharmacist uh, within the UK. She's She's during this pandemic. She's partnered with um, nurses, doctors, uh, as well as other prescribing pharmacists to ensure that the service is maintained to the highest possible standard during this pandemic. Um, the, the community pharmacy that she worked at was commissioned to offer the end of life care medicines provision. However, what she's found as a challenge is men and women are still not seen as equals, even in this day and age, and extreme extremely important to put gender roles uh, and barriers aside from all of this uh, and ensure as human beings that we all come together for the greater good. What she's found really interesting and really important also is that frontline workers um, and in the UK you know we're fortunate that you know pharmacists are becoming to be recognized as frontline workers which is really important and endorsed and recognized by the government not only have they been working all hours of the day and providing the leadership that's required, they've also been um, providing the frontline support to our patients uh, um, for when, uh, for as and when it's been required. Thank you very much. Um, on to the next slide, and I'd like to hand over to Carleen to introduce her slides. Um, good evening, everybody, or good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm Colleen McMoore, and I was going to discuss um, two pharmacists as well as um, a pharmaceutical body and what they've been doing to adapt um, in the COVID, where they've been able to show both leadership and also how they've balanced work and life. So, to be able to go to the next slide, I wanted to discuss, um, and then the next slide again, um, a pharmacist, Anna Barwick. So she's actually doing her PhD, as well as working in the university, as well as on top of that, um, launching her business, which actually launched today. So it's Farm Online. This is a website that includes a podcast, video and blogs for patient education and telehealth across Australia for pharmacists who require flexible hours. She started off with volunteers and is watching demand and income before taking it forward. She wanted to create a business that enables patients to advocate for themselves and make informed choices about their health. 
Anna also wants to advocate for pharmacists as she believes they can be undervalued. It's taken two months to get to this stage from launch. Um, it's timely as people are now more reliant on technology and this company creates part-time roles for people with families and convenience as it can be done remotely. Creating this business has not come without sacrifice. Anna has had to skip some time that she spent playing with her kids, losing some time with, for reading for enjoyment. She's also had to do some homeschooling. It has become a very big after hours and weekend passion project for her as she uses time once her kids are in bed. She gets up earlier in the morning at 5.30, so one to two hours before the rest of the family to work on the website. She admits that it's tiring and not easy. And the project has taken away some time with her husband and this has been difficult to balance. She said that during COVID-19, it has reduced um, social get togethers and expectations, which has freed up some time for her. Um, and her greatest motivation is doing it for her family and showing them that mum can juggle projects and can do something innovative. She shared that to start the business, she started with a discussion with a small business grant support group called an SRI, so a smart region incubator who help identify women founders and startups. She's currently applying for government grants and she said that this opportunity has great, created some great opportunities to meet new mentors. She was discussing where she hopes to see her business um, in three months, how she hopes it can be a working trial of telehealth by pharmacists for common ailments and medication management, and that she can accumulate evidence that is valued, that can show that it's a valued service, meeting a gap in the market. She said that in one year, she hopes she's employing multiple pharmacists to offer video content, telehealth consultations, and regular blogs. And in five years, she's hoping that it's servicing patients across Australia and potentially internationally. Anna's advice to other people who want to start a project is to find a cheer squad, family, mentors, friends, and colleagues who will pull you through when you second guess yourself. She said it's been a great opportunity to reach out and talk to a variety of people and also delegate or share responsibilities for what you cannot do or do not have time for. So that was sharing Anna Barwick's story of how she's created a business during COVID-19 and really brought it to life to meet the needs during this time. If we're able to go to the next slide, I'd like to share um, Brad Butt's story. Um, he's been working on, so he's got his own pharmacy and he's a community pharmacist. And he also has his Men's Health Down Under program, which was started in 2012. And more recently, it's been building websites and the business is really growing. He started off as having one patient a week for prostate issues, penile rehabilitation, medication and devices. Um, when it first started, Brad was an early career pharmacist in community pharmacy in Canberra. And he noticed that it was on the job learning with no income. He used his downtime to study, review patient, um, review papers while the business started and he was seeing patients and receiving referral letters. Now there are four pharmacists delivering service at an offsite clinic who are motivated and are great support to Brad. Brad changed the layout of the pharmacy. He changed the product lines. He removed items that were not health and male related to make it a male friendly environment. He said the Men's Health Clinic, which also doubles for vaccinations during um, COVID-19 as well, runs three days a week in a private consultation space, seeing 20 patients a week with multiple referral sites to the Men's Health Clinic or even self-referral. And he's got a consultation room set up like a psychologist office to be quite conversational with each consultation taking 45 minutes. And he's outsourced um, aspects like compounding and the clinic also supplies specialized medications. He did note that most products are private and can be expensive, so he tries to manage the cost to improve compliance and get better outcomes. And he also provides a telehealth service, and that's how he's quite adapted during the COVID-19 to provide consultations across different states, and he can work closely with professors and urologists to learn. He started getting an income recently when he started charging for services to make it more financially viable, but he did admit that his bread and butter is still patients coming into the pharmacy. And he said that he did need more pharmacists to spend more time in the pharmacy during coronavirus, but telehealth and also still focusing on the clinic, it still grew. And he was also able to split his time with the immunizations. So Brad really building his business during COVID-19 talked about being patient centered, the men's health clinic being born out of necessity as 10,000 people in Australia alone have had a prostatectomy. 
Um, he admits that he could not run the men's health clinic as a solo pharmacist, and he has required support from his business partners. He was talking about some of the sacrifices that he's made for his work-life balance, because he's also mentioned that some of his regular patients have suffered a little as he's not able to always be available. He admits to having some family sacrifices, such as when he gets home late or works on the weekend to get a patient handout written, or he can be working until two or three in the morning and get up at six to help with his little ones. He said financially it's cost quite a bit of money to build the website and import products. It's taken him a, quite a while to get to this point. And he did say that if he tried to build his business too quickly, it would have burnt out his partners, his family and his financial resources. He stated that the clinic has not been great for work-life balance as he has three little kids and he's had to try to find a balance by finishing at the right time and helping with cooking and picking up the kids to reduce the burden on his partner. And he describes utilising some of the hours of sleep to do additional work if you are a person who's motivated to do so. Brad hopes that in a few years, he hopes to have multiple standalone clinics in capital cities across Australia, with dozens of community pharmacists working with GPs and urologists and developing their own devices. And his advice to people looking to build a business, especially in challenging times, was if you think you can make a difference, then find a mentor and stick to your guns. Find a mentor who can guide you through the process who is not just inspirational. He said, find a way to better support the local community and give it a go, because the worst that can happen is it doesn't work. He said he's happy to talk to pharmacists who are interested in men's health, especially early career pharmacists. And he's offered the opportunity for anyone to come and visit his pharmacy to learn and take a look. It does involve a bit of a travel to Australia, so it's not applicable for everybody or practical at the moment, but it's a great opportunity. If we're able to move to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> This one is just talking about um, a professional body and just how they've responded during the COVID-19 and how they've had, how they've advocated and assisted with the implementation of emergency supply of medicines without prescription for up to 30 days, because previously it was only three days. Um, how Australia's adapted to image prescriptions. So this is part of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia to help ensure that pharmacists understood how to work with image prescriptions which provided legal status to faxed and emailed prescriptions, which was very complex because it was conflicting between state and federal legislation. Also medicine shortages and helping facilitate communication um, and support for the government to develop therapeutic substitution, as well as electronic prescriptions, which is assisting in the implementation of a truly electronic prescription paperless communication, the impact on workflow and how pharmacists can be engaged, motivated, and adapt in this new system. So those are some of my stories about all some of the experiences that pharmacists have experienced in the coronavirus and how they've adapted, been motivated to take on new opportunities and try to balance work and life. So now I'd like to pass on to Nadia Bakari um, to take us through the next um, case studies. Hello and uh, welcome everybody. Um, Nadia Bukhari here. So I'm actually going to be uh, uh, sharing with you three uh, cases from pharmacy heroes in Pakistan. Um, I interviewed them, asked them all four very uh, pertinent questions. Firstly, their role during COVID-19. Um, also, the kind of challenges that they've uh, faces faced their achievements and sacrifices, as well as uh, the impact on the work-life balance. And uh, as we're, uh, the theme today is both leadership and gender equity, <clears throat> also asking, posing the question, uh, do they think men and women have the same opportunities to reach leadership positions in the pharmacy workforce? So uh, we'll start with the first case. Next slide, please. So our first pharmacist here is uh, Dr. Huma Rashid, um, and uh, she is a pharmacist, she's an assistant uh, professor, at, and uh, also is uh, the president of the National Alliance for Women in Pharmacy in Pakistan as well. And she's working at the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, uh, University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences in Lahore, Pakistan. So the first question to Huma was with regards to her, her role during COVID-19 and how has she uh, acted as a leader? Um, so as a leader, she says that you have to come forward, be informed and provide direction with clarity. Leadership in COVID times has its own challenges. The information is fast changing, as we all know, uh, and it's coming from various directions. 
Uh, at home, you need to be a role model for self-discipline, positivity, and maintaining work routine so that the family also can follow this. In the pharmacy, reaching out and educating the public and providing accurate and current information on opportunities of learning, coping, and connecting people and organizations to, e to each other. And as a, as a leader, you provide your community hope and inspiration and direction. COVID-19 for Huma has been an opportunity to highlight the pharmacist's role and the magnitude of responsibility that lies on the shoulders of the profession. As a practitioner, Huma has been working with uh, Dr. EPK uh, for helping development of necessary protocols for the COVID-19 hotline at the Ministry of Health, after which Doctors, which is a leading uh, med uh, telemedicine platform in Pakistan and the National Alliance for Women in Pharmacy, uh, drafted a guidance for pharmacy teams uh, protection during COVID-19. And this was uh, de developed alongside, uh, which was a first for Pakistan. And this benchmarked the pharmacy profession's importance and its role in, COVID, in the COVID pandemic, which has now been endorsed by the Drug Regulatory Authority Pakistan and also the Ministry of Health. As an academic, Huma has uh, kept her teaching duties uh, ongoing, but remotely, <clears throat> and she feels that this pandemic invites universities and the education system to be more productive, objective orientated, and resetting priorities and goals in academia is very important and now should, be in, uh, now should uh, take priority post COVID. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the second question was re with regards to the impact uh, the pandemic has had on work balance. Um, for Huma, the workload has multiplied with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in Pakistan. Uh, it includes the professional as well as domestic work. With the closure of universities, online classes have started. Um, home help is not available due to social distancing and lockdown uh, in place. So uh, Huma herself has had to set sanitation practices as well as role sharing with all the family members. Uh, when it comes to running chores, I'm sure we could all relate to that. Um, uh, Huma is a single parent and during this time it's become an even bigger challenge, but she's also found that her, her children have been far more adaptable. Uh, the online classes have had uh, flexible timings and it was challenge for her to be at home and not be able to address uh, the personal issues that are arising while she's actually teaching online. Uh, and uh, again, many of us can relate to that as well. And at times it's given her the feeling of guilt um, and she is struggling to deal with this. Achievements and sacrifices that Huma has made. She believes that COVID has made uh, her more productive um, and more objective orientated. We give value to our time and we do what is needed on the priority and address what is needed at that very given time. Um, but she also feels that COVID has brought people together. She was able to contribute at a national level through the development of the COVID guidelines for pharmacies, as mentioned before. Uh, she's published commentaries in academic journals, and she was able to also lead and facilitate what was her dream for pharmacy practice education, was uh, to train students under the supervision of a uh, practicing pharmacist and have them um, deliver pharmacy services like medication reviews. Huma believes that we've uh, learned to be more empathetic, not forgetting to ask if a person on the other side is doing okay. Um, and as, she, uh, as said before, she, uh, at a personal level, it's brought families together and made bonding stronger. And she feels that uh, being a single parent, this is actually the longest time that her kids have ever seen her at home uh, during their life. So that, that's, uh, that's a, a very important achievement there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So here's the big question. Do you think men and women have the same opportunities to reach leadership positions uh, in the pharmacy workforce and what are the challenges and barriers? So uh, Huma says that in, in uh, the, a country like Pakistan, her answer is uh, a hard no. Uh, the major reason is that women get less chances of moving ahead. Um, they have mobility restrictions uh, because of work timings. And she feels that to become successful, uh, to become a successful professional and reach leadership positions, you need connectivity, social networking, and at times take on extra work on a voluntary basis. Every woman manages to get a conducive and uh, supportive atmosphere from home, even if they do. They are left out of the loop because they're not part of the current power hubs, which are unfortunately male dominant. Women aren't invited or present or are invited to present uh, on decision making forums um, and they cut out from opportunities that are given to men. 
Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that mostly it's thought that men are more rightful to leadership because they are running households, they are the main breadwinners, and they need to pro progress. And the women uh, take on careers just as a hobby. Uh, women should be facilitated rather than discouraged to be involved. Uh, meeting structures should be made, keeping in view that people have to attend to their family lives too. Women should support other women and make sure that their presence is established, which is easier now when work from home and the flexible working hours has become a norm. So we'll move on to our next case uh, of, uh, next slide please. Thank you. So here we have um, uh, Dr. Roxana Youssef, who is a TPN and a septic pharmacist, uh, also in Lahore. Uh, um, Roxana has been working as a TPN uh, uh, and extemp department manager uh, for quite some time and she's also a clinical pharmacist for bone marrow transplants and has been assigned as an additional duty uh, uh, for, her, for the COVID isolation unit at the hospital. As a pharmacist working in public sector, um, Huma, uh, no, sorry, uh, Roxana and her team have had to work for more than one department due to a shortage of pharmacists. Uh, so she is having to juggle all these uh, duties. Uh, in late March, when the official lockdown started in Pakistan, it was expected that inpatient services would be minimized for a while. But for the pediatric intensive care units and hematology oncology department, it was practically impossible to minimize or stop. The services haven't stopped despite the lockdown and they've been working around the clock to ensure continuity of services. Roxana is responsible for her staff and has taken precautionary measures starting from restricting contact to availability of every kind of PPE for her team, instructing the proper use of PPE but also counselling um, the staff um, regarding any stress that they are having in addition uh, to her regular routine. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, impact on uh, work-life balance. The balance has been disturbed because there is a constant emotional pressure to perform well and to save everyone all the time and everywhere. Um, uh, Roxana has had to be on her toes constantly to manage workload in the hospital and at home, which has been quite hard for her in the initial days of the pandemic, um, as there were so many uh, precautions that needed to be, uh, take place, but also the fear and the worry of bringing the virus home. This pandemic and the lockdown has added um, Roxana's responsibilities um, as a female, as a healthcare provider, but also as a caregiver at home. Not only does she have to take the precautionary measures herself after reaching home to protect her family, but she also has to manage all these additional responsibilities, which is proving to be very, very challenging. Achievements and sacrifices that Roxana has made. Um, so she's had to work continuously, irrespective of the fact that most people are uh, at home or working from home. And she has had to go to the hospital daily um, and carrying that fear of uh, exposure and bringing the infection home. Before the pandemic, um, Roxana used to take care of her mother and be uh, with her most of the time as a caregiver. But these days, because of her, uh, the, the nature of her work, she has restricted contact with her mother in order to protect her. She uh, has to put in more effort in explaining protective measures and their effects to everyone uh, around her, both in the workplace and at home. She's still managing the TPN in the extent department successfully without taking a single day's break uh, and providing pharmaceutical care to critically ill patients despite Pakistan having crossed the 100,000 mark of positive cases and a large number of hospital staff also being effective. So they are running on a, on a skeleton staff service at the moment. Uh, last, next slide, please. So uh, the question again, with regards to the opportunities for females and, and males uh, within the pharmacy workforce in Pakistan. So um, Roxana believes that as far as the public sector hospitals are concerned, there are more opportunities for both men and women, though less number of um, seats in public sector on the whole. In community pharmacy, there are less opportunities for women as compared to male pharmacists, and obviously more challenges for women in pharmacy, no matter which sector it is. In a Pakistani society, there are challenges in, in maintaining work-life balances. The situation is more severe in the smaller towns. Um, fe for female pharmacists, they don't have the opportunities to work in their ho hometown, and every female then can't relocate just for the purpose of work um, due to uh, social barriers. 
Um, a large percentage of pharmacists in Pakistan are females um, and, they're due, and um, due to lack of opportunities and work challenges as a whole, they do not work as a pharmacist. So they, they graduated, but they are um, un, underemployed. With experience of more than 15 years uh, of, uh, that Roxana has of working in both public and the private sector, she believes that pharmacists are very much needed in the healthcare system. Uh, pharmacists and pharmacy services should be an integral part of any healthcare facility to uplift and uh, the healthcare standards. There's a dire need that pharmacists play their role as leaders, ir irrespective of their gender, but the majority of the pharmacy workforce does comprise of women, and there are unfortunately fewer uh, female pharmacists as leaders. There are some, but not as many as we'd like to see. Therefore, females should be um, uh, uh, come forward and play their roles. So our last case, if we move on to the last slide, please. And we have a male pharmacist from Pakistan. So here we've got uh, Dr. Zanair Maksud, who is a pharmacist, uh, and he is in charge of uh, central pharmacy and uh, the outpatient department pharmacies and satellite pharmacies within his setting. Um, in his role, he began to uh, disseminate information and knowledge about the coronavirus, its mode of transmission amongst colleagues and subordinates to raise awareness. Um, he emphasized the education of uh, junior level staff as they have very minimal medical background, but because they're moving around the hospital because of their nature of work, he felt it's very important uh, to educate them. And to better their understanding, he displayed pictograms of portions at the entrance of the central pharmacy so that they could actually adopt this into their daily routine. He also modified the procedural conduct of the store by limiting access of personnel from other departments, reducing the number of workers by shifting them to alternate days. Um, and he's also uh, responsible for the procurement of PPEs, disinfectants for the hospital as well. Um, and he also uh, is responsible for the procurement of uh, medication like hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir. Um, next slide, please. The impact of uh, Zonera's work-life balance. He believes that the lines have been severely blurred like never before. Uh, as far as the workplace is concerned, we have to get uh, our temperature checked as we enter the hospital, the whole PPE, mask, gloves, sanitation. Um, and he believes, you know, doing this on a daily basis, it can really take its toll. When he comes home, he's got to remove his shoes outside, he takes his clothes off, he has to uh, segregate his clothes, showers, and, he, and he has, he's also a father of a 15-month-old uh, boy uh, who often runs to him as soon as he comes through the door and he, has, and he finds it really hard to, to move, separate himself from his son uh, so that he can take the necessary precautions before he can actually attend to his son and his family. He's overly concerned that he's bringing the virus home from the workplace because it can threaten the life of his loved ones. He has a younger brother who is vulnerable. He's uh, taking corticosteroids and immunosuppressants. And he also has an elderly diabetic father as well. So he's all constantly concerned about their health and safety. Uh, when he comes back home, work doesn't end there. He has to make around 20 to 25 calls with regards to uh, procurement as well. Um, and uh, that can also uh, be quite challenging for him as he feels uh, uh, his wife gets often upset um, because, you know, he's not spending that time with the family. But she herself, being a pharmacist, uh, is, is quite supportive and understanding. So. Uh, achievements and uh, sacrifices made, if we can just change the slide please, nearly there. Um, in this era of the pandemic, the only achievement that has been satisfying for uh, Zunair is seeing that our patients are being successfully treated and going back to their families and leading a normal life. However, he feels that this is a huge sacrifice on his part, risking his life and his family's life. Um, and he's al already mentioned the, the, the sacrifices that he's taking with regards to the work-life balance and he still is he's unable and he's working round the clock and un unable to take any annual leave as well. So when I asked him the question, uh, what does he feel with regards to men and women having the same opportunities to uh, reach leadership positions within Pakistan uh, in the pharmacy workforce, he also believed that uh, there isn't uh, the same opportunities. Um, 
and he feels that uh, women face a lot more challenges than men do. Uh, in Pakistan, it's a male dominate, uh, dominating society and some communities, but not all, only in some, it's considered absurd for a woman to go out and work and the social and cultural norms refrain them from working independently as an entrepreneur. He feels that many women start excelling in their career, but when they get married, uh, restrictions are put onto them to quit their jobs. Similarly, after having children, there's uh, societal pressures, increasing them on to take uh, care of their children rather than their careers. And it's difficult for a woman then to maintain a work-life balance with this lack of support. But he believes that if husbands, families support women, they can excel and they can be great leaders. Um, he's personally working under a, a, a fantastic female pharmacy director for the past three years and he finds her a great leader and he, he believes that she is actually more assertive and dedicated towards her work than he's found in some male leaders. There's a lack of role models he believes for women in, uh, in Pakistan in pharmacy and um, the graduates are increasing by the day approximately 70 percent um, and he feels that these young girls have hardly any female leadership figures that can that they can aspire to or follow so three uh, perspectives there from three amazing pharmacy heroes who are doing a fantastic job in Pakistan I'm going to hand it over now to Toyan hello hello Let's see, starting our video. Thank you so much for such a great uh, presentation today. Um, we have a number of uh, minutes to take questions at this point. The panelists have done a fantastic job. This is a very difficult subject to talk about and I'm so glad that we had both uh, male and female perspectives expressed here. Um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat box. We just have a couple of minutes. If you're asking a question, please include your um, country. Thank you so much for your participation today. Can All I, right. Toyin, um, just a quick, uh, yes. yeah, just, just a quick, uh, I, I think that one of the great things that we just saw is that um, the reflection about gender equity is not just for women. And I, I think everybody has kind of said this as we're juggling everything at home, but really realizing that um, we need also men to be allies. And somebody had asked a question, you know, what can I do? I think one of the things is to really be active in seeking those perspectives and how we can actually, again, build policies or programs around taking those perspectives, really listening, and again, baking in the support that's required for them to succeed. And I think that's been a key that I've noticed in everybody's presentations is really thinking about how we can be together stronger and seek that perspective very actively. Just wanted to mention that. No, that's great. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you modeling the presentation by showing your uh, kids in the video because it's the truth. What we assume is different from what really is happening. I want to use this opportunity to thank everybody for how you have chosen to cope you know, with this whole pandemic situation, homeschooling plus being an excellent person at work, um, whether you're male or female and all the challenges that you've been facing, supporting the family and at the same time, making sure that your workplace is, is going on nicely. Thank you very much for all that you have done in the past several weeks. Um, so at this time, it looks like we're gonna wrap up the uh, session. We didn't have questions on the question and A session. Mostly thank yous is what we've had. Uh, we encourage you to please um, go back and, and share the, the video. And for those who joined us on Facebook Live, we thank you so much. Um, and just spread the good word. And if you notice that somebody is not really uh, understanding all the complexities of this subject matter, invite them to uh, listen to this uh, video or recording. 
Thank you again to all our panelists. Sorry, can I just add Excellent something? Yes, just, Nadia. I just wanted to add something um, and just to uh, enforce what everybody has said here. We've, we've had uh, various cases from around the world today. And one thing we can see are very common themes. We're all going through the same issues um, and we really are all in this together. Yes, we are. Thank you from all around the world, UK, Middle East, Jordan, Iraq, Africa, Asia, the US, Turkey. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.